So good. Um, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are. Um, now, welcome to today's session where you know you'll have an opportunity to ask me, you know, almost anything about managing the quality of the practice of analytics. Uh, my name is Michiko Walcott. I will be the host, the presenter, and the moderator for the session. Um, for those of you who do not know me, um, a little bit of introduction. So I, I currently work as a strategic and management consultant um, advising clients on the non-technical aspects of data and analytics. Uh, my focus is especially on kind of closing that gap between the technical and the business side, as well as among the various stakeholders involved in data and analytics, um, including obviously our clients or the business or the researchers, right? Um, everything outside of basically doing analytics, that data and analytics, you know, that make um, data and analytics more successful and run more smoothly. So I've been in this, the, the whole data and analytics consulting and delivery business for over 20 years. And I've run a large multinational consulting analytics consulting practice and spend a good chunk of my professional life in data companies. Um, I, I've advised clients on both strategic and kind of tactical matters. And a lot of what I do today is really focused on what I call like the organizational infrastructure, like setting up organizational or business structure and processes. And, you know, in other words, the organizational systems, if you would, that enable good data and analytics practices. And so as hot as a topic of you know, data and analytics is today, you know, there are a lot of misconceptions and confusions and just things that people and organizations are doing. They're just not effective, right? Um, and a lot of it comes from the lack of understanding or even awareness. And so as, my, as you might imagine, um, I spent a lot of time kind of trying to straighten out some, you know, some of these misconceptions and confusions. And oh, by the way, I use the term analytics um, rather broadly for convenience. Um, that includes statistics, data science, and other related fields and branches. So none of this is really all that specific to a particular type of applied data analysis, if you would. So before we start, uh, a couple of housekeeping items. Um, so first, um, as um, you may be aware, this, for, this session is being recorded. So by staying in the meeting, um, you can send to be part of the recording. And But that said, um, feel free to leave and wait for the recording because everybody who registered will receive a link to the recording as well as a copy of the slide deck. Um, and since I will be running a one person show, I apologize in advance for any glitches and mishaps. Um, in consideration for the other attendees, as well as to make the session a little bit more manageable for me, your cooperation in keeping your video and mic off is very much appreciated. Um, in theory, you're not, you should not be able, you should be able, you shouldn't be able to unmute or put on video, but you know, things happen. So the objective of this session is to create the awareness and understanding about what it means to manage the quality of analytics, right? So I'll present a kind of a broad framework as well as some practical considerations, but it's not meant to be a comprehensive course on analytics quality. Also, despite the title managing the quality of analytics practice, a good portion of this will be on the individual, right? What analytics practitioners need to think about on a day-to-day -day basis rather than you know, management or more of an organizational pro um, program, et cetera. Although there is heavy component of that as well. Um, the session is meant primarily for analytics practitioners, but it should be general enough for people in business and research. There is no requisite technical knowledge. Um, I'm going to speak primarily from the analytics practitioner's point of view, but that's really more for convenience. I have to refer to somebody somewhere. Um, also, it's true that the topic is very closely related to project management, but I, I'll address project management only from the um, perspective of managing the quality of the project. Um, because best practices in analytics project management is just really an entire topic on its own. And um, of course, client management is also loosely related, but obviously an entirely different animal also. So we'll start the session with what we mean by the quality of analytics practice. 
then we'll cover the dimensions of quality with respect to analytics practice and some practical considerations for implementing a quality program for analytics. I'll address some of the questions that were already submitted as I go along. Then we'll get to open Q&A. And for this, please use the chat panel to submit your questions throughout. You don't need to wait until the Q&A portion to submit your question, although you can. Um, I'll try to answer as many as I can in the time we have. Now, unmuting has been disabled to help me manage the session, um, as I um, uh, quickly mentioned earlier. Um, by the way, if you registered and submitted a question in the last 30 minutes, please do resubmit um, here during the session because I would not have seen it. Um, and of course, we have participants um, and listeners and watchers from all over the world. And so you can submit your question in English, Spanish, Portuguese, or heck, even Japanese, I suppose. Uh, but the answers will be in English. And if you speak some other language, I'm sorry. So, um, okay, define, let's define the quality of analytics practice. What do we mean by that? We think a lot about using analytics to improve the quality of something else, right? We'll measure something or we'll see how, uh, how much variability something else has, et cetera. But we don't really talk much about the quality of the analytics themselves or the quality of what we do as analytics practitioners. And when we do, it's either like way too vague or way too, <clears throat> way too narrow, excuse me. And again, we're talking about the quality of what we do rather than using what we do to assess the quality of something else. Now, most of us want quality in what we do. You know, it's for the pride of you know, workmanship or for our own reputation. It's the right thing to do and so on, right? But quality is also incredibly hard to articulate. You just kind of know when it's there, right? And in fact, people often try to implement analytics quality programs, but they don't really go anywhere because they start with what quality notionally looks like, not what, you know, not with what quality actually is. And of course, we're all responsible for, you know, quality of our own work, what we do, right? Um, now, there is some precedent for formalizing the idea, especially in the official statistics domain, but they kind of tend to focus on the statistical output rather than on the, the practice of statistics. And often they have you know, limited, very limited applicability. As an example, um, Eurostat right, has papers on statistical quality, but their focus is on really on the quality of the statistical output, which is really only a part of the broader statistical practice. And um, also they're specifically on official statistics and the, their QA framework is really largely institutional. So we need something a lot broader we can use in our own individual and organizational practices more generally. Um, now, even from the questions that were submitted already, it's kind of evident that analytics practitioners tend to focus more on the technical aspects of producing a more technically precise output. But the quality of what we do is a lot broader than that. So we'll see um, some aspects of this in a little bit. So let's start with what quality is, right? And air quotes. Take, for example, um, the, the definition of quality by the American Society for Quality. And this is just an example. The characteristics of a product or service that bear on its ability to satisfy stated or implied needs or a product or service free of deficiencies. Okay. Now, either way, it's about meeting some set of criteria or standards. And the definitions by other established quality experts and organizations are actually quite similar. So then this kind of leads us to the idea of defect. Right, so whenever any of those criteria or standards are not met, we have a defect. Now, this is measurable, as in like you know number of defects per million opportunities that some of us are you know quite familiar with. Then, fewer the defects, higher the quality. Right, so you don't have a, a fewer blemishes. You don't have any um, thing that's noticeable, etc. It's perfectly smooth, if you would. Then, higher the quality. 
So then you can kind of look at it as um, the equality as the absence of defects or you know, fewer defects, you know, those kind of things. So then what is the business case for quality? You know, we keep talking about it and we keep talking about we, us, you know, wanting to do it and so forth, but you know, what's the business case, right? So the most obvious one is risk management. So a defect usually has some negative consequences, right? So eliminating them will reduce the associated risks. And this includes things like, you know, biases and could even have ethical implications, which can get quite scary. Now, since each defect is an erosion of value or effectiveness, then eliminating defects allows you to get more out of analytics. Also, fewer defects over time mean more trust and confidence in the analytics, especially by those who consume the analytics. Now, that sort of leads to better use of analytics. This is really more about the human side, right, of how we work with our um, the consumers of analytics, our clients and the business and the researchers. And finally, the quality of analytics has a big overlap with analytics governance. But you know, this is an entire discussion in itself, and we won't have time to get into that. But it definitely is an element has an element of analytics governance to it. So, you know, we tend to assume that we don't make errors. We're analytics people, we're statisticians, we're data scientists, um, we are fully trained, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, but, and we sort of don't really think about how, you know, we don't, we don't, think, we don't think that we make errors. Um, but every time I have the opportunity to implement a full-on analytics quality program, even the most senior people are just super surprised at the number of defects um, that get identified. It's funny because, you know, as much as some of us say that we're detail oriented, like, you know, you say that in job interviews, right? That doesn't really mean that we are defect free. And in fact, we produce many more defects than we ever realize. So there are two primary dimensions to how defects happen. The first is really competency. Do you know your stuff? And then the second is intent. Did you mean to do it? Now, if you're competent and you meant to do it, then the defect is intentional. And of course, the worst case of this is sabotage, right? Um, but in most cases, it's really legit. There's a good reason and you just need to justify and document it. Now, if it's intentional, but you don't know your stuff, then you have a competency gap. You need to do something to close that gap, right? Training, et cetera, right? Learn more stuff. The vast, vast majority of the errors are produced by people who really know their stuff, but did not mean to do it or forgot why they did it in the first place. And if you don't know your stuff and, and you didn't mean to do it, well, you know, that's, I don't know what to say about that, but now, there are other things that influence how the defect happens, like do you mean well or do you even care? One of our biggest complaints about quality is really centered around the quality of the data. I want to make clear that this is not within the scope of this talk, despite what you may think. There is already an entire discipline with various certification programs around this topic. So the DAMA, uh, data management body of knowledge, for example, is one of the widely accepted industry standards. Now, if you've been to one of my data management sessions in the past, you may recall that you know, we have done a, a broad kind of overview of all this. So data quality is not in scope of this talk, of this chat. Um, but I do want to introduce these, um, the idea briefly, strictly as a motivation for ourselves. So although there are variations, the dimensions of data quality are fairly well defined. And they are how populated or complete is it? Are the values technically valid? Um, accuracy, are there errors? Consistency, are the values consistent across? Integrity, is the data coherent? Um, does, it, does the data reflect the timing of interest? Uniqueness, is there any duplication or fragmentation? And finally, does it reasonably reflect the reality? So at the risk of upsetting some analytics practitioners, 
with some exceptions for us, um, for us analytics practitioners, data quality is a dependency and a constraint. It is not what we do. Um, I say that because I have already upset some people by saying this, but I also know that many people are not really aware of the scope of data management, especially in today's world. Um, and I, 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 um, I, well, I insist that analytics practitioners depend on and are constrained by data quality because of the just the the the, the world we live in today, if not you know even before, but. Data quality is not the objective of analytics practitioners. That's one way to put it, right? But data quality is a key objective of data management practitioners, not necessarily analytics practitioners. So keep that in mind. Now, if anybody is interested more in the data quality topic, I'd be happy to talk offline. So it's such a big topic. We can, however, extend the idea to define our own set of dimensions, right? So first and foremost, is the analysis design and execution appropriate for the question or the need? Now, this includes you know, things like data selection, the sampling design, the analysis approaches and techniques, et cetera, right? Defects here can really cause bias or even irrelevant results and have obvious implications, even if you end up doing everything else completely perfectly, right? Second, is everything clear and free of ambiguities? Now, this includes things like definitions, methods, logic, and steps, et cetera. Consistency, is the analysis tool and system agnostic? Does it produce the same result every time you run the same thing? So a common counterexample here is like, using a variable seed for generating random numbers and using software specific functions. Can you trace the lineage of the entire analysis from start to finish? Now this may be documented as flowcharts, for example, or timestamps of outputs or logs can be a proof that you, know, you ran the script in order. Now a common trap that I see actually quite often here is when you try, you know, when you run your scripts interactively, right? You know, like you can highlight certain parts of the code and just, you know, run just that part, right? I cannot tell you how many times that has caused things to be kind of untraceable and even produce wrong results because things just sort of executed out of order. So if you're doing a lot of interactive stuff, make sure that you have a final run that's clean and guaranteed to be order from, in order from start to finish. Now, traceability does extend to data lineage to some degree. Again, we are not you know, always accountable for data lineage, but we are responsible for knowing how the data came to be because we do need to know how that impacts our analysis. Accuracy, um, here, this is different from the statistical definition of accuracy. What we mean by um, accuracy here is really the absence of errors in execution. Transparency. Can you explain the results that the analysis, uh, the, the analysis result um, or um, the analytic itself? Is everything about the analysis clearly documented so that another person can understand from start to finish? Completeness. Is the logic free of gaps? Have you considered or accounted for everything that matters? And last but not least, justifiability, right? Do you have a defensible reason for everything? This isn't necessarily about the best choice, but the choice you make has to make sense. So what are the risks, dependencies, and limitations of your choice? So a failure in replica, uh, rec a failure in replicability, goodness, and reproducibility should have defects in at least one of these dimensions. Now, there were a handful of questions that were submitted around documenting projects. You know, documenting is really hard, right? Now, obviously, some cases require a lot more formal documentation than others, but in general, we tend to get super hung up on the form of documenting, and we let that stop us from documenting at all. Now, the hardest thing in documenting is starting. It's much easier to react to something that's already there 
think how much easier it is to you know, review a document somebody else wrote rather than to write one from scratch. So what needs to happen here is sort of mentally reframe what it means to document. Um, find a way to create something for you to react to yourself. The, the key to documentation is to you know, make it easy, as easy as possible for you to document. So, um, so there are you know, any number of things you can do here. Um, it, as simple as like, you know, I've always kept a running notes document where I would just dump everything, you know, every thought, every comment, emails, messages, and meeting notes, et cetera, you know, any random thoughts that I have into a single Word document, um, which admittedly, yes, can get quite messy, but guess what? It's searchable, right? It's basically a poor man's wiki. Um, I've also created a database of sorts with a field for everything I need to record for every project to make sure those things get recorded. Now, you know, that's not that different from like creating a, a documentation template where you have all the headings and so forth. Um, I've also recorded myself then generated a transcription um, because sometimes it's a lot easier for me to talk than to actually type things out. Um, there are some tools that, that do that. Um, I'm also um, this kind of working memory challenged. So when a thought comes up while I'm out there, then I need to, oh, I need to go um, document that or look at it or whatever. I just take voice notes on my phone and then you know, transcribe that later. The point is just make it as easy as possible, right? There's any number of things you can do. And you know, some, some things are gonna be more accessible or easier or more natural to you than others. Then it's just a matter of putting some structure into all the stuff you've collected. And then you can put any level of formality you want um, after that. But in the end, Tools are really not all that relevant. Um, now, for more general project management, yeah, that's a little bit different, and, and that's a topic for a different discussion. But in any case, just think function before form, and, and you'll feel a lot better about it. Um, remember also that the code is a part of our documentation, right? If you do a lot of coding. Um, or even scripts, and it, maybe not even scripts, even like workflows, right, that you have, if you do a lot of point and click, um, workflow itself is also um, part of the documentation. So we've heard many times and know how important it is to comment our code or comment our stuff, but we tend to comment what the code does, um, as opposed to, um, well, if we do comment at all, right? Um, it's actually more important to comment why it is coded that way. Um, rather than just what it does. Also, um, complex and sophisticated code is cool, right? But it can be quite counterproductive to transparency, depending on how you do it. And so I, I, I've even kind of like dumbed down a little bit my code for the sake of clarity of logic and readability. Simple and basic is better than long and complex because it just makes it easier, makes it clearer and um, if I happen to like just not exist tomorrow, like, you know, just die tomorrow, then then somebody else can read the code and hopefully understand what's going on or and the, the documentation. Now, because our profession does not exist without our clients and colleagues, the quality of our work necessarily includes various aspects of project delivery, such as did you set clear expectations? Did you meet these expectations? Did you justify everything analytical and non-analytical? Did you document everything? Um, is the project free of any outstanding issues? And finally, does the client agree that all expectations and requirements were, uh, requirements were met? Uh, now, this is different from the soft, softer aspects of client management, but all these are within the scope of the quality we have to manage. Now, quality management is a life cycle, and while there are variations, it generally consists of these components. The first is quality planning. You define how you're going to design quality into your product. The second is quality assurance. And so this is about the methodology and the tactics to reduce defects as you execute. The third is quality control, making sure that you've done what you need it to do. So this is kind of like basically inspection, right? If you do quality planning and assurance well, that is, you know, if you design and execute well uh, with quality in mind, then quality control just becomes a little bit more straightforward. 
And in fact, it can be quite straightforward. And finally, quality improvement, which we can think of as like post-launch or post-publication, right? Now it's true that quality assurance and quality control are often, you know, as terms, right? Often used interchangeably. And some people even define it the other way around. Now, what you actually call them isn't really all that important, as long as you understand that there are four components. Um, for the purpose of our discussion, we'll just stick to these definitions here. So let's map this to what we do as analytics practitioners. So here is a typical analytics project lifecycle. Um, even if your practice doesn't explicitly have these stages, you can still view even a single consultation as a microcosm of this life cycle with the same concepts. So the discover part is typically, you know, we're talking about the pre-project stage. And so we'll put that aside for now. Quality planning happens primarily in the design stage. It kind of makes sense, right? You design the analysis and the project, therefore how you're going to plan and design quality into the analysis and the project. Quality assurance is executing the project and analysis in such a way that you reduce defects. This is actually as you go along doing it, right? It's how you do the project. So it spans from design to development all the way down to deployment. Now there are methodologies, standards, best practices, et cetera, that helps us do exactly that. It's important to define and standardize practice. Now, you know, we, as analytics practitioners, we tend to argue that, well, you don't know until you know this or the other thing, you know, whatever. But you would be surprised how much you can standardize, not just, you know, routines and macros, but the general approaches and the steps in how you go about doing things. Now, quality control makes sure you've done everything you're supposed to do. So it may consist of things like checklists, reviews, and audits, right? Even design has a doing aspects that can be inspected. And so, um, but interestingly, whatever notions of quality we have held about analytics projects are usually focused on quality control, especially in form of peer review. I'll get to this in a little bit. Now, quality post-launch has two parts. The first is the quality maintenance in the ongoing application and maintenance of the analytic itself, right? So that has to be kind of maintained and sort of monitored and so forth. It primarily, it has to do with like the external validity and operational defects, um, like system problems, changes in data structure, changes in the context or behaviors, et cetera. The second part, is the improving the system of quality of analytics, right? Or analytics practice. So how can we do it better the next time? So for this, you want to understand the root causes of the defects you've seen so far, then figure out ways to keep them from happening in the first place. So that's you know, quintessential process improvement. Now, there are any number of process improvement tactics you can incorporate here, but you, know, you have to look at this as improving your own process, which takes, you know, honestly, it takes a good bit of self-recognition um, and then feed that into learn, you know, feed that learning into how you do quality planning, quality assurance, and quality control. The bottom line is to ensure the quality, um, the real quality of what you do, you have to address all four components of quality, quality planning, quality assurance, quality control, and quality maintenance and improvement. To prove the quality of our work, we often expect others to put a stamp of quality and you know, just stop there, right? They, they passed the, the, the review of somebody or you know, uh, they said it's good, you know, this is good analysis and so forth. But that's pure inspection, right? Remember, you cannot inspect quality into a product, as Deming said. Um, if whether we do quality work depends 100% on other people saying that we do quality work, then we don't really have quality. It's important to keep that in mind. So let's look at the part of quality that's actually you know, probably more familiar to us as analytics practitioners. 
Now, I've been involved in implementing Analex quality control as a system of independent reviews in several organizations, but it does not have to be a separate team. Um, creating an independent team is often encouraged or even mandated in some cases, but it has pros and cons. And of course, this is more challenging for smaller organizations and downright nearly impossible for individuals, right? Because there's only one of you. Uh, but there are other ways to do this and still maintain some level of independence. Now, how depends on the needs and the circumstances. It is, however, useful to conceptually separate the delivery audit from the expert review, especially in our case as analytics practitioners. The reason is that we naturally tend to focus on the latter, the, the expert review, and often neglect the former. So remember the vast majority of the defects are not technical. So as a quick summary, both are responsible for questioning what was done, right? But the delivery audit takes on quite literally an audit function. So verifying against requirements, make sure that uh, making sure that you've done everything you said you were going to do, um, that you have justified yourself, that everything is documented, and that there are no obvious tactical errors. Now, in contrast, the expert review is much like the peer review that happens with journals and so forth, right? Against good technical practices. Now, this is traditionally what we have focused on, but there are so many defects that have very little to do with our technical ex expertise. Again, I've seen a lot of surprise senior statisticians by all the defects we identify. In delivery audit, um, the, the lack of expertise by the auditor can actually be quite helpful because innocent questions often lead to error discovery. On the other hand, expertise is you know, required in the, uh, the expert reviewer for obvious reasons. Um, it is also a good thing for the person doing expert review to understand and be familiar with the project. In contrast with delivery audit, being familiar with the project is not all that helpful and it actually, in fact, can be a bad thing because you lose that kind of arm's length independence. Again, if we do well in quality planning and assurance, then this becomes very straightforward. Again, you cannot inspect quality into a product, um, as Deming said. Although some level of inspection is kind of um, needed for um, based on what we do. So some practical considerations for implementing a quality program or just making all this happen from my own experience. First of all, Inventory the analytics in the project. You need to know what it is that you're managing the quality of. Define who does what. Will you have an independent team or independent analysts within the same team? Who signs off on what? Who will own the quality program? This is you know, kind of starting to sound a lot like governance, right? Processes and procedures. What does the workflow look like? You'll also need like, you know, standard operating procedures. Now, this isn't really about micromanaging every task, but rather about defining a common flow of activities to make it a lot more predictable. Standards and policies. What will the defects be against? So this includes checklists, forms, standards for auditability, et cetera. Things like, you know, modularize everything. Don't overwrite objects and data sets. Avoid functions that are specific to the software. Structure your development so that it's straightforward to test implementation, et cetera. You may have other you know, regulatory requirements. I can go on and on and on. The basic infrastructure includes a document store of some sort, some sort of a log, shared environment, et cetera. If you productionalize your analytics for your organization, then you're going to need a test environment with a large controlled data set beyond just unit testing. I've seen a lot of organizations just stop at unit testing. And I can tell you from experience that that doesn't cover everything. Um, there are so many ways that errors can happen and looking at just handful of cases, even if you make them to cover you know, specific scenarios, just cannot come close to covering the universe of errors. Um, in a couple of places, uh, we used to um, uh, require at least like 100,000 independent cases 
um, this is this was for kind of mass testing, but even then we'll come across like one or two errors that shouldn't happen. And so then we have to go fix it. So it's uh, unit testing has limitations for you know, the purpose of discovering defects. Then finally, the analysts need the training on the, the quality expectations as well as on, the, uh, as on the, the methodologies and the techniques for quality. So the challenge here is that good quality practices often run counter to what you know, many of us analytics practitioners might kind of consider, consider like sophisticated, elegant, and advanced. So we need a bit of a shift in mindset. Um, all individual analysts really need to understand quality assurance, what we do as analysts on a day-to-day -day basis to create quality from within and not try to, again, inspect quality into a product. I've seen a lot and there's so much more and obviously this is just the tip of the iceberg. So before we go on to Q&A, you can check out what else I have to say on my website and sign, sign up for future email updates and so forth. Um, I try to do one of these sessions every so many months, every few months. Um, you can follow me on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook with that. Um, I'm happy to take on any questions and comments. So if you have any questions or comments, please do type in, in the chat box and I will, I'll try to address it um, as much as I can. No questions, no comments, no complaints. Ah, expand on the difference between quality assurance and qu the other one that happens in parallel. Um, okay, uh, probably, I think you're referring to, let me see, this is not the best way to get there. I think this is where you're probably referring to. Um, so quality assurance is what you do as, um, as, as an analyst, right? So if you are responsible for doing an analysis, um, there are things you can do um, proactively to avoid, so, I think one way to look at it is quality assurance is proactive, whereas quality control is reactive, right? Quality assurance is what you do proactively as an analyst to avoid a lot of things that, shouldn't, uh, that we don't want to happen. Quality control is sort of coming from behind and say, okay, did it actually not happen? Um, and so the, the quality control is very similar to inspection, whereas quality assurance is really being more proactive about um, how you go about doing your analysis. And so there's a lot of things you can do there. And typically what happens is that the quality control, quality assurance has you know, like a list of things that you are supposed to do as an analyst or you're supposed to not do as an analyst. And you, have, you may have a list of things, right? Quality control will come back and say, kind of take similar lists, same list sometimes, similar lists and say, did you do it? Did you do it? Did you do it? As well as quality control um, will it be a peer review or be a delivery audit they'll sort of, you know, make sure, did you justify this? Did you justify that, et cetera? You know, those kind of things. And so probably the best way to uh, uh, describe it is that assurance is more proactive, quality control is more reactive. Hopefully that, um, that, that answers that question. Um, next comment. 
see, comment question. The mod, could you, could you say it's, it's like difference between model design versus model assumptions? That the um, checking model assumptions, they're, they're ch checking model assumptions a little bit gray, gets a little bit gray because um, you're checking something, but at the end of the day, you're sort of like doing it, um, let's see, design, you can, you can, you have an a, 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 the assurance aspect in design as well as actually doing it, right? So like one, in one example I brought up earlier is the, um, the, uh, the, 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 what is it? It's the variable seed in, 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 in generating random numbers. Um, so in quality assurance, you as an analyst would avoid using variable seed um, in, in, in random number generators. Now in quality control, when you come back and actually make sure that you didn't do that, right? So it's a little bit backward looking. It's making sure, so it's one, there, there's one aspect of, okay, I am going to make sure I don't do this going into kind of moving forward. And then after everything is done or after it is actually done, going back and checking to, to kind of double checking, right? Making sure that you actually did not do what you were not supposed to do. So it's like, you can think of it as, as double checking. So checking model assumption, it's sort of like checking something you don't know. So it's not like, um, it, it's a little bit different because if you violate, then you can kind of go back and do other things. Um, and one aspect of quality, quality control, I think is that if you, if, if, some, if you find a defect there, then you know, sometimes yes, you can go and do other things, but other times it could actually, um, <laughs> it could actually kind of invalidate everything. So. It's, it's important to sort of look forward and knowing what it is that you're not supposed to do or knowing what it is that you're supposed to do and so as you execute um, and then on um, later making sure that, you know, it's sort of double checking your, your, your checklist to make sure that you actually, you know, sort of complied with those things. Compliance, um, uh, inspection, you know, those kind of tend to be more uh, uh, associated with control. So it's the, it's controlling as opposed to making sure, that, assuring that you're doing make, you know things. Controlling is like okay, yes or no, right? So it's like think of it like um, in in a production in a in a manufacturing setting. You know, what happens in quality control? You can sort of inspect everything. If the if some if you find a defect and and then the lot doesn't go out, right? But you want to make sure that you uh, you don't get there and in in the actual manufacturing process. And so then that's kind of analogous to um, quality assurance. The, um, the a point is the next one point here um, is that, you know, quality assurance and quality control, both, you know, the, the, there, there's, there's cost to poor quality, right? Um, if you do it, the whole idea of quality assurance and not wait until the quality control is that earlier you find the defects, cheaper and quicker it's going to be and easier it's going to be. Um, definitely, um, the, it'll take less time to fix. Um, it'll be more salvageable if something happens to go wrong. And um, it'll, it'll be cheaper for very, very many reasons. And that's true of manufacturing. That's true of analytics practice. Um, and so the idea is that if you, if you are conscious of what makes a good product as you are doing the analysis, then quality control becomes a little bit simpler because then that the fact that you're conscious about doing the uh, the the doing things a certain way will make the 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 number of defects go down on its own, and so that's an important aspect. Um, at that, you know, you first of all, you know, kind of understand what it is that you should be doing or should not be doing. So it might be helpful to sit down and sort of create a list of what you should do and what you shouldn't do, right? So like create a checklist, it's to create a cheat sheet for tests, right? You're studying for a test in some sense. And the quality control kind of is like an exam, okay? Did you do this? Did you do this? You know, do you know this, et cetera? But kind of create a cheat sheet, study for the exam. Uh, you know what you're gonna be tested on and um, sort of do those things while um, you're actually executing the analysis. It's again, this kind of comes back to making sure that you're doing proactively doing everything you can as early on in the process as you can in order to save yourself time, money, you know, headache, uh, embarrassment, et cetera, later.
any other questions or comments? Hopefully that makes sense. It, it's, it's, I think it's like, it's helpful to think of it even in the manufacturing terms, right? Um, the, it's, think of what we make um, analysis as a product, as a, a, you know, although it's not tangible, you can think of it as a product and sort of make parallels to how we can do this. Obviously it's, the, it's not exactly the same thing because one is quite tangible and the other isn't. Um, but so try to kind of, you know, we can make a, a parallel between what goes on in manufacturing and how defects get um, introduced or avoided, um, reduced in manufacturing setting and sort of take the same approach, not necessarily the same technique again, because it's not the same thing, but take the same approach or same, same mindset at least to um, reduce defects. And the idea, I mean, even the idea that analytics, you know, our projects, what we do, the analysis, you know, the models, the, uh, the, the, the experiments, that the idea that those can have defects, right? I think in itself is kind of a, um, a it, it's, 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 a, it's a thought that I don't think, you know, a lot of us stop and think about. Anything else? Going once. Going twice. Well, thank you very much. Um, uh, you will receive, like I said, a recording as well as the uh, the slide deck, um, and. Um, Please, you know, feel free to um, circle back. And um, uh, if you have any questions or if you need, you know, um, want to brainstorm or need some help, et cetera, I'm um, always available. Thank you very much. And you guys have a great day.